Well, good morning. Today we're going to talk about everywhere you look. Because it seemed like this week, everywhere I looked, there was something relevant that I wanted to talk about. Especially, I, I actually got an early start this week. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, I had some extra time. So I was putting things together. And I thought, you know, we've got enough for Sunday. And then I don't even know if I remember what I was reading on Monday or Tuesday because so many things have happened in just the past two or three days that I think are relevant to at least what we always look at is the stage setting and the convergence of events that seem to be uh, moving us forward in these end times. There's a number of things that I'm probably not even going to touch on today. Let me just start with a couple of interesting articles that I found that I think are, that I think are relevant. We often hear that uh, one of the, you know, evolution is true and you can't challenge evolution and it's, it's, just, it's just an accepted fact. Well, this is an article from The Atlantic. You can't really see the title that well. It says, what really killed the dinosaurs? And there's a very interesting video I saw this week that takes a, uh, a universal flood model and shows how we would end up with this type of flood model as the floodwaters came over the earth from the breakup of the fountains of the deep and that sort of thing. What we find is we find these dinosaur bones and fossils in graveyards all over the place. Uh, there's a giant one out in Colorado called Dinosaur National Monument. It's a dinosaur graveyard. And it shows that all of these dinosaurs were killed very, very quickly. I've often used the example that if something just dies, it usually doesn't turn into a fossil. It needs some kind of rapid burial. So when I go on Saturday mornings, I go early to play golf. And I have to tell you that the carnage on the highway is unbelievable. <laughs> and there are dead critters all over the place. But when I come home, <laughs> they've been hit by a number of cars, or crows have got to them, and they're smaller. <laughs> they've started to disappear. They don't fossilize. It has, you have to have some kind of rapid burial. And what we see all over the world are these dinosaur graveyards with massive amounts of dinosaur bones. So, and, and this has always been interesting to me too, is one of the premises of evolution is that it takes, what, billions and billions of years for all of life, the complexity of life, to evolve. But then they say all, virtually all life was destroyed when an asteroid hit the Earth 65 million years ago. That's sort of the accepted wisdom. Well, if everything had to start over 65 million years ago and it took them billions of years to get there, how come it didn't take billions of years since 65 million years ago to get all of the comp complex life? Now, I'm not necessarily... I'm, I'm not. I'm, I will stipulate that I'm not a scientist, but, you know, that doesn't mean I, do, I, I abandoned logic and that sort of thing. But what killed the dinosaurs? There's a, very, there's a big battle going on now. What caused the extinction of dinosaurs? And one lady, she's come up with this theory. Now, she ties it, see, what happened to the dinosaurs is going to happen to us because we're causing global warming and we're putting the same things into the atmosphere that what her theory is, is that volcanoes erupted all over the world, sent things into the atmosphere, and that's what killed the dinosaurs. Now, I think that's probably, her view is probably more consistent with a universal flood model, a catastrophe all over the world, and that these uh, creatures were fleeing, and that's when they were overwhelmed and buried. But the, 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 the other part of this article that's interesting from the Atlantic is there not was not one extinction, there were like four extinctions, which makes the evolutionary model even more preposterous in my view that it happened that way. And again, if you have questions about this and you don't agree with me, you know, Steve Mitchell, you can find his email 
And so this is an interesting article, and it just shows that there's not agreement in science, and it's this myth that you, you learn in college, you have to go to college to uh, have common sense beat out of you, and this is, just one, this is just one example of it. Now, I've talked a lot about demographics and how the demographics in the world are changing rapidly. I saw some more statistics this week that the population growth in, in Africa, the continent of Africa, is just, it's, it's, sh it's shocking because so many of their people are young. They have high fertility rates and they're growing at a very, very rapid pace. The, so what I found this, I think it was on Newsweek's website, a article about what are going to be the largest cities in 2100. So let me use my usual disclaimer. Just because I talk about what people are projecting about what might happen in 2050 or 2100 does not mean that I think that the Lord will tarry that long. I personally don't. It could be. So by, by referencing this, I, what I'm trying to show you is what people who study population and demographics are projecting for the world is massive change over the next less than 100 years. And personally, I believe that a lot of these changes that they're predicting are going to take place much more quickly than... 50 years or 30 years or, or 80 years. So what this article does is it, it lists the 100 largest cities projected in 2100. It's a very fascinating study. You can find it on the Newsweek website. I would ch I, personally, I went through the list. I don't know that I recognized more than 60% uh, of the cities on the list. Most of them were cities I had never heard of. And these cities are projected to grow to populations of 15, 20, 30, 40 million people by 2100. So I'm just going to pick out the top five. And a lot of the cities are in either uh, China, of course, in, not as many in China as you would expect, India, Pakistan, Asia mostly, and Africa, especially West Africa with a number of cities on there, and only one or two of which I had ever heard of. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's shocking to show the changes, the rapid changes, the convergence of events and things that we're seeing. So here's the top five. Uh, Delhi, India. Current population, 17 million. By 2100, projected population of Delhi, 57 million people a growth rate of 237%. Uh, imagine three times as many people, almost four times as many people in that city, which is already suffering from overcrowding. Number four, Mumbai. Growth from tw 20 million in India, Mumbai, 20 million in 2010 to 67 million in 2100. And already the traffic is impossible there. It's, here's one, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, East Africa. Current population, 5.5 million. By 2100, population, 73 million. Number two, Kinshasa in the Congo, West Africa. Current population, 9 million. Projected growth, 822%, population in 2100, 83 million. And then the largest city in the world in 2100, Lagos, Nigeria, currently 10 million, projected to grow to 88 million people. Now, that's projection and statistics, and you can make arguments about it, but one thing that you should take away from this is, by the way, Europe had one city, Paris, in the top 100. I think it was number, it was either 67 or 87, oh, I, and London, and London. The United States had four, no, five, Miami, New York, 
Philadelphia, Chicago, and Los Angeles. But New York, which is currently in the top 10 in the world, would fall to about number 40 in 2100. Now, personally, because of jobs and economics and that sort of thing and resources, I, I don't know if Lagos will have 83 million people, but I do know that, should the Lord tarry, if Lagos can't support 83 million people, what do people do when they can't find job work resources? They, what, they move somewhere else. What's close to Africa? Europe. Europe, and I've mentioned this a number of times, Europe will change dramatically. So, interesting. I'm going to do an interview tomorrow night on minute, minute for mid, a minute for, minute for midnight, and we're going to talk a little bit about censorship, so I'm going to just touch briefly on this. Prager University is a conservative organization that puts up five-minute videos. Their tagline is, you give us five minutes, we'll give you a semester. Now, Prager University is not a real university. You don't get degrees. There's no buildings or anything like that. But this year, last year, this year, Prager University is the largest YouTube uh, channel on, on Earth. And it's putting out very good content. I've watched a lot of these videos. You should, if you have students, you should make them watch one of these every day because they're good, they're well thought out, they're good thinking, they, they promote good, conservative, Judeo-Christian values, and it would be very valuable for your family, your youth group, whatever, to be watching these videos, rather than some of the nonsense I'm gonna talk about in a moment that goes on in our universities, and sadly, a lot of the churches today. So Prager put up a number of, uh, by the way, this year projected Prager University on YouTube will get one billion, over one billion views. This is huge, these are huge numbers. And, I, and I'm very grateful for that. But what's happened? Well, there was a lawsuit that Prager University uh, filed. It was dismissed, but they were saying that they were being banned by YouTube in violation of YouTube's terms of service. And YouTube came in, oh, we're not banning you, we're not banning you. But this week, Prager University put up nine posts on Facebook. On Facebook, they have three million followers. For example, Fellowship Bible Chapel, we have about 25,000 subscribers on YouTube. And by the way, you may need to go and resubscribe, or if you haven't subscribed, go and subscribe because people are being removed from subscription lists. I've had a number of people write to me and say, I used to get a notice about your update every week. Now, I don't get anything. And I went to YouTube and I found out that I had been unsubscribed without my permission. And this is the way it's called shadow banning. This is what Twitter's doing. It's what Facebook's doing. It's what, it's what YouTube is doing. So they put up nine posts. They have three million followers on Facebook. And the statistics they did from those nine posts, originally for like a day and a half, showed zero engagement on those posts, which meant that their followers were not seeing those posts on Facebook. Now, it went up a little bit. After a few days, they actually maybe had 21 people who had viewed their post. And this, this is statistically impossible. So they complained about it, and Facebook said this, we mistakenly removed these videos and have restored them because they don't break our standards. This will reverse any reduction in content distribution you've experienced. We're very sorry and are continuing to look into what happened with your page. And Prager University said, does anybody really believe that that's, this was a mistake? <laughs> and it's not a mistake, it's done intentionally. Look, they banned Alex Jones, other people are being banned, Facebook channels are being taken down. And what they're doing is they're getting, whereas the government won't ban speech, they're getting these corporations to do it. Because frankly, corporations are the biggest fascists on the planet. 
And there is a political correctness and a line to toe in corporations all over the world. And they're doing it, finan they're trying to do it financially. The New City, state of New York has a lawsuit, or no, they've issued some regulations that would make it very difficult for the National Rifle Association to do banking. Most banks are headquartered or have offices in New York. And the banks, they don't want to get sued. It's expensive. I like it when, to be honest with you, I like it when people get sued. That's, that's good for business. But I'm, I'm only thinking of myself. You're right. I'm, so, you know, I'm selfish that way. I like to have a job. I like to be busy. But these banks, so they're, they're not doing transactions with certain conservative, mostly, almost universally conservative organizations. I, I never hear of Islamic State bannings or that type of thing. I'm sure that happens, but you just don't hear about it. Here's one from Robert Spencer, Jihad Watch. MasterCard says it blacklisted Robert Spencer because of illegal content, to which he has been trying to find out. And his website is very good. You should go, you should make it one of your ones that you look at quite often. And I, I challenge you to find out what illegal content is there. I mean, what, what was wrong with the harvest, Greg Laurie's harvest crusade billboards that I mentioned last week that were taken down from some malls, but because a few people complained. And so they, they did it. And so here they are, MasterCard is pulling, and, and Spencer's going, I don't even have a MasterCard. And Jihad Watch and I am being banned. And just mark my words, PayPal and others are going to go through this, and there's going to be a politically correct list. And so the government is going to get these corporations to do what the government could not do directly because of the First Amendment. Here's one, Google workers protest secrecy in China project. So what Google is doing is they're developing a search engine for China. China is not a free country. Saw a report that they're demolishing churches right now as we speak all over China. There's also reports, I don't even have, I've got graphics in here, but I didn't have time to put them into my, my uh, slides. China is rounding up the Uyghurs, which are la largely in Western China. They are largely Muslim, and rounding them up into these massive concentration internment camps. And I mean, do you really hear much about this? No, you hear, you know, Omarosa gets way more than mil millions. I'm telling you, millions of people are being rounded up in China. China has a plan. They want to dominate things. They're going into Africa. They're going in elsewhere. They're going into Turkey, and they're providing financial assistance to Turkey, and they're getting them beholden to China on the debt side to do what China wants. And it's a very clever plan. Facebook has gone to banks asking them to provide people's financial information to them. I, this, this will be, it'll be all okay, I'm sure, that Facebook has access to all of this information. And here's what's happening. Big corporations like Google, like Facebook, other social media companies, they take the path of least resistance. So last year, the European Union enacted various free speech laws, hate speech regulations for the internet companies. So the internet companies say, well, we have to comply with these laws here, so we'll just apply this everywhere. And I think this is what's going to happen. Google is developing a search engine for China. Now, well, what's wrong with the Google search engine that's out there already? Well, we give Chinese people access to information that the Chinese government doesn't want them to have access to. So they've asked Google to censor 
the search results. And so Google is working on that, and the Google workers are even complaining about this. Facebook wants your financial information, and soon what we're going to have is China has put in place a social credit score. I've talked about it a number of times. And if you think that it's just going to stay in China, you're very naive. These things will migrate here, and everybody will say, well, that's a private company. They can do whatever they want. Well, we have certain laws and regulations, too, that they need to comply with. And this is a huge problem. This is something that uh, Congress needs to work on. This, was a, this took place in San Bernardino, uh, California, yesterday. Um, a man was taking his wife to the hospital for a C-section and ICE agents showed up and arrested him. And now everybody's just all upset. Oh, this is just terrible. Like ICE is out of control and that type of thing. And they, they left his pregnant wife there. Look at how evil ICE is. And we need to abolish ICE. But what nobody says is, at least the reports I've read say that the ICE authorities had a warrant from Mexico where the man was wanted on homicide charges. And so when you go to enforce the law now, it, we're, we're really, um, I would say, not walking, we're not running, we're rocketing towards anarchy in some aspects in this country. Jack Phillips in Lakewood, Colorado, masterpiece cake shop. He won the Supreme Court case. They said that you had been mistreated by the Colorado Human Rights Commission and the way they handled your case and therefore because you refused to bake a cake for a gay wedding that they were wrong and so he won that case so now somebody comes in and they wanted him to be, to do I'm not sure if I get the story straight uh, they wanted to do a pink cake with blue icing or a blue cake with pink icing to celebrate their transition from male to female or vice versa. A trans and he said, no, I'm not going to do that. So now he's being brought up on charges again by the Colorado Human Rights Commission. And look, what they want is they don't want this guy to have a cake shop. They want him out of business because he doesn't toe the politically correct line. It's fascism. And you would hope somebody would do something. So he's filed a lawsuit now. It was filed by Alliance Defending Freedom on his behalf in the District Court of Colorado, federal court. Um, let's see. Okay. This is, um, I showed you about the nonsense going on in colleges and universities. This is our Romans 1 section of the update which shows that people are losing their ability to reason. And what Campus Reform did was they went through and they've looked at college catalogs as to what courses are being offered in universities and colleges around the country now. Now this is from 2014, but my understanding is that the, uh, this is the course syllabus from a course at Harvard Divinity School. Harvard Divinity School. Harvard was founded as a religious institution. I think it's safe to say that Harvard has deviated from its foundations, its roots. It has moved on to, well, if, if you can't call Harvard Divinity School apostate now, you can't call anybody apostate, I guess. The, the word has no meaning. So this is a title that the, um, title of the course, Religion 2488, Queer Theology, Queer Religions. And so this is what uh, the course syllabus says they're going to try to accomplish in this class. Listen to what they're going to try to accomplish. We will begin by sampling the efforts to revise traditional Christian theologies in order to accept or affirm same-sex loves. We will test the boundaries of, quote, Christianity while considering the varied forms of queer religion outside familiar religious institutions in spirituality or spiritualism, in magic or neopaganism, in erotic asceticism. 
And so when you see this nonsense, is it any wonder, like yesterday in Arkansas, they paraded a Baphomet, a satanic, the Satanists per, 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 paraded a satanic statue around, they didn't, they didn't plan it, but they had it there for a few hours, around the state capitol in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I personally, I think, as I looked at that, I thought, this, this, is, this has prophetic significance. Someday, it's not going to be a statue. It's going to be someone possessed by Satan who's going to go into a temple and declare themselves above all that is called God. And the Satanists will get exactly what they want for a time. And we know how long that will be, 1,260 days. Scripture tells us that in a number of places. Another college, this is um, Pomona College in California. Queering Childhood is the title of this article. Now, this article came out early in the week, and I'll get to the report from Pennsylvania in just a moment. It's, this is what I would call very bad timing for these colleges. This interdisciplinary course examines the figure of the child and how this figure is used by politics, law, and medicine to justify continued cultural investment in reproductive heteronormativity and productive able-bodiedness. In doing so, we examine the queer and crip children and childhoods against which the figure of the child is articulated. This course draws on work in gender studies, childhood studies, disability studies, and queer theology. And then lists some authors. And there's actually a prerequisite to the course, because I think if you don't have that prerequisite, you would get the syllabus at the beginning of class and you'll say, what? I'm here to learn what? This is what? This is... It's, and it's not just one college. Here is uh, the new school in New York, a very liberal institution, as liberal as the place over in Yellow Springs, Antioch. I don't know if the Antioch is still around or not. I know they went out of business for a couple years. If you're ever in Ohio, go to Green Springs, Yellow Springs, I'm sorry, Yellow Springs, and uh, it's like a trip back into the 60s with the uh, tie-dye t-shirts and people walking around on the street stoned out of their minds. I mean, I've, I've been there a few times. I, it's unbelievable. And, and Antioch was maybe the most left-wing liberal institution on the planet for a time. New, the new school gave, gives them a run for their money. So their course catalog says, queering and decolonizing theology this fall. So there's a... Oops, I thought I had another slide on that. Oh, here we go. This is what they hope to accomplish in the class. Christian theology is often depicted as a violent colonial force standing in particular opposition, a violent colonial force standing in particular opposition to LGBTQI lives. However, over the last 30 years, people of faith, activists, and theorists alike have rediscovered what is queer within Christianity. Now look, last week I played you, was it last week or the week before, I played you clips of Nate Collins and some others speaking at the Revoice Conference. And I had people write to me and say, oh, you know, you're making too much of this. They want a traditional Christian ethic. You're overblowing it, John. You don't understand. It's really not that bad. They... They have a traditional sexual ethic of celibacy and that sort of thing. And then I'm like, listen to what they said. What, listen to what Nate Collins said about getting, getting rid of the idolatry of the nuclear family. It takes a village of village idiots, in their view, to raise a child. Now, don't send me emails about that. I apologize. No, I don't apologize. That's what they are. Romans 1 said this is where they end up. And at some point we have to speak 
truth to this, not, especially, especially when it's invading the church. These people go out and call themselves evangelicals. So we need to evaluate what they're saying and teaching. But listen, how over the last 30 years, people of faith, activists and theorists alike, have rediscovered what is queer within Christianity, uncovered what is religious within secular queer communities, and used post-colonial theory to decolonize lived religious practices and theologies. This course surveys queer and trans readings of biblical texts. It introduces students to the complexity of constructions of sex, gender, and identity in one of the most influential literary works produced in ancient times. By reading the Bible with the methods of queer and trans theoretical approaches, and this is where they're going, this class destabilizes long-held assumptions about what the Bible and religion says about gender and sexuality. So listen, I'll give them credit for being honest what they want to do. And this is what Swart, uh, the new school, there's also Swarthmore has some uh, classes that they're offering. I don't think I have any slides on that. And this is what they want to do, is they want to tear down traditional Christian theology and teaching on sexual identity, gender, marriage, family, that sort of thing. It, it is a well-designed, well-thought-out plot. And it's probably been going on far longer than we even realize. But now what's happened is it's bleeding over into the church. Austin, Texas had its Pride Festival last week. And this is Jen Hatmaker running around giving hugs to all the people at the Pride Festival. And if you've ever seen some of the videos on the, the stuff that goes on at these Pride Festivals is pretty shocking. And so Jen Hatmaker, who claims to be an evangelical, she does church conferences and and that's those sort of things all over the place. She tweets, oh, look at how wonderful we're doing. My beloved little church went downtown to the Austin Pride Parade and gave out free mom hugs, free dad hugs, free grandma hugs, and free pastor hugs like it was our paying jobs. Our arms were never empty. We happy hugged a ton of folks, but dozens of times I'd spot someone in the parade, look our way, squint at our shirts and posters, and race into our arms. By the way, I saw this on Twitter, Rachel Held Evans, she was sharing this on Twitter. And do you see who else shared this on Twitter? Sandy Patty. Next year, Oklahoma City, that's the area that she lives in now, we're coming for you, my arms are ready to hug. Now, I don't mind if people want to express concern, but there's also the thing about speaking truth and love. And I'm pretty confident that speaking truth and love does not happen with Jen Hatmaker. She's in favor of same-sex marriage. She has made that abundantly clear. So if somebody invites you to a women's conference and I think they still call it a women's conference. <laughs> How narrow-minded are they? talk about heteronormativity. <laughs> um, you're not going to hear the truth about what the Bible says. This is moving into many other areas in evangelicalism. Excuse me here, I'm looking through my... I'm clearly out of order here. There is an organization called Living Out. It's a group of gay Anglican priests. They say they're committed to celibacy, and they've got a website, a biblical perspective on being Christian and gay. 
And they have a conference. They had a conference just a f eight weeks, not even eight, about eight weeks ago. The lead speaker at that conference was an American pastor named Tim Keller, talking about identity in Christ. And coming out of that conference is a church audit that your church can say as to how you're doing in this particular area. So I'm just going to read some of the things on the church audit. You can download it right here. We're not taking it here, by the way. Uh, look at what some of these say. Number seven. A godly Christian's sexual orientation would never prevent them from exercising their spiritual gifts or serving in leadership in your church. True, false, not sure. Number 10, by the way, at Andy, based on what Andy Stanley talked about in a sermon four or five years ago, I think it was called Between Grace and Truthy, he would say true. Just go listen to it. Go find the sermon and listen to it. No one, would be, no one would be pressured into expecting or seeking any healing or change that God has not promised any of us until the renewal of all things. This is what the church audit is. This is what, and you can look at the website, Tim Keller supports. Be careful. This stuff is coming into the church like the beginning part of a tsunami. Mark my words. And what's going to happen is when it does come in, it will then be a ground to persecute those who hold to traditional, biblical, family, nuclear family, Judeo-Christian values. And persecution will largely come from within what everyone thinks is the church. And this is what Jesus talked about. He talked about it in Matthew chapter 24. He talked about it in Luke chapter 21. He talked about it in John chapter 15. People are going to persecute you. They're going to say all manner of false things against you. I'm going to divide families. It's, it was a prophecy. It's coming. It's going to be particularly intense as we get closer to the return of the Lord. So, not wringing my hands over it. I'm just telling you this is a fact. And I'm telling you, this is what's coming. Prepare for it. How do you do that? Well, steal your mind and steal your heart. Why? Because they're going to try to get you to change. Look at all the pastors that they've gotten to change already. A vineyard pastor up in Ann Arbor, now I think a former vineyard pastor, Ken Wilson, writes a book, a letter to my congregation about his support of same-sex marriage. Now he's got a website. I don't even remember the name of it. It's, it's shocking. It's shocking. And I don't know if people are warning again. Listen, Ken Wilson is a wolf. Avoid him. He will lead you down the wrong path. I don't know if other vineyard churches are telling their people this or not. I don't know. I think they should be. The area that this is coming also in is social justice. Ed Stetzer, who used to head up Lifeway, the Lifeway stores, and that type of thing, wrote John MacArthur has a new series out on social justice and evangelicals, and Ed, Mac Ed Stetzer said this, it will be interesting to see if he, John MacArthur, is as fair, nuanced, and accurate with that as he was with the charismatic movement or the seeker movement or the emerging church. Now listen, we can argue and we can quibble about what he said about the charismatic church, but I don't think there's any question that what he said about the seeker movement and the emerging church movement was absolutely correct. And so where is Ed Stetzer now? He's poo-pooing people who warned about the emerging church. He used to run Lifeway. He's a professor at, at Wheaton. He's a wolf. Avoid him. And if you challenge him, you'll get banned. Justin Peters tweeted this in response to Ed. Ed, you have no reason to suggest that he will not be fair. He has always been. 
It's not like he ever defended, oh, I don't know, heaven tourism books he knew to be false. That would be awkward, huh, Ed? <laughs> and these books, one of which was sold uh, about a kid going to heaven, and Lifeway was told, the kid said, it's not true. It didn't happen. And Lifeway continued to sell the book. Um, it's, uh, it's shocking. Okay, I'm, um, oh, I know why. So I have to mention this. Um, hey, it's not Hillary. Okay, it's just the spawn of Hillary. And I'm not, it, it's true, okay? I mean, listen, I feel bad for her, her upbringing. And she was speaking this week at Rise Up for Roe. Because why? Because Kavanaugh's coming in and everybody says Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned and this is terrible. So there was a series of tweets and she said, this is from Chelsea, thank you for Rise Up for Roe for a great event today, more even deepest gratitude for all of you. P packed, that's Planned Parenthood, and NARAL are, do, are doing to protect women's rights to make the choices we think best for ourselves and our families. Newsweek took what she said at the thing and they, whoops, they tweeted this, Chelsea Clinton says trillions added to economy since abortion made legal. Because women have added, because women are dying in abortions, back alley abortions, therefore they're in the economy, they don't have to have babies they don't want, they can go to work. So it's been about three and a half trillion dollars added to the economy since Roe versus Wade came in. And that's a, that's, and so Roe is good because it's more money in our pocket, more money to give to the Clinton Foundation and other organizations. And when she called on one, she goes, I didn't make a casual statement, she said. I said the rise, the rise of women working from the, uh, from the 1970s on is not disconnected from reproductive rights the ability to make choices, and when to have children. More on this dynamic today, and she cites this article at Center for American Progress, a radical left-wing website organization, if there ever was one. Linking reproductive health care access to labor market opportunities for women. So I thought what I would do is I would play for you exactly what Hillary, not Hillary, um, young Hillary, Chelsea, Hillary Jr. said. Um, so here's, what, here's actually what she said. So this is a video. It's just, she's down in the left-hand corner. Whether you kind of fundamentally care about reproductive rights and access, right, because again, these are not the same thing. Um, if you care about social justice or economic justice, um, agency, you, you have to care about this, right? It is not a disconnected fact to Justice T-shirt of 1973 that American women entering the labor force from 1970 to 2009 added three and a half trillion dollars to our economy, right? Like the net new entrance of women, that is not disconnected from the fact that Roe became the law of the land in January of 1973. So, I think whatever it is that people say they care about, I think you can connect to this issue. Of course, I would hope that they would care about our equal rights and dignity to make our own choices. Um, but if that is not sufficiently persuasive, um, hopefully kind of some of these other arguments that you're hearing expressed so beautifully will be. Okay. So, um, so she said, you know, and she's, now she's defending it. Dinesh D'Souza was, it's kind of an interesting thread on her Twitter page. But this abortion thing, I didn't play this a couple weeks ago when I found out about it. There was a conference back in May at the John Paul II Academy. Um, there was a guy named Ettore Gotti Tedeschi. He used to be the head of the Vatican Bank. So he's a Roman Catholic. And what he said was, um, 
I didn't have time to edit the video. I'll just summarize what he said. Is the New World Order planned this? They planned to have a demographic collapse. Remember where I started? With the change, massive change in population, which leads to, if they don't have the resources, immigration and collapsing societies and that type of thing and making essentially chaos for a time. Because things change. And this was, this was planned. Speaking at the first international conference of the John Paul II Academy for Human Life and the Family, a town economist and banker, Ettore Gatti Tedeschi, said efforts to decrease the world's population by globalist elites have set in motion a series of predictable and intended economic, geopolitical, and social catastrophes meant to persuade people around the world to accept a global political vision that would eliminate national sovereignty and institute Gnostic environmentalism as its universal religion. The guy's speaking very much the truth. The recurrent themes of the present papacy are poverty, immigration, and the environment. And we are led to believe, that's Pope Francis's uh, papacy, and we are led to believe that these are caused by the greed of bankers, war and man, the cancer of nature, he said. But this is fake news. For him, the cause behind all of these scourges is the collapse in births. The people pushing this fake news, he said, are Gnostic prophets, such as population control prophets, Paul Ehrlich, Jeremy Sachs, and Ban Ki-moon, who, rejecting the natural law and divine order of creation, seek to proselytize the world with their anti-Catholic gnosis. According to Dadeshi, the greatest enemy of the new world order is the family because it provides education, autonomy, and independence from the state. And then he says the second is the Catholic Church, and we can talk about that later. The demographic collapse, he said, quote, was planned without any doubt. It is unthinkable that the decision makers in the United States and around the world did not know what they would have create, that they would have created by refusing life in the natural law. Good words true and play right into Bible prophecy and what's predicted. So you see why I start reading these and I start following this link and that link and this paper and that paper and that's why I never get this thing done <laughs> before I, even when I walk up here. I think that I talked, um, well, there's this. Um, grand jury in Pennsylvania spent two years, two years investigating sexual abuse by priests. They came out with a report this week, identified over 300 priests and over 1,000 victims. Now, because of the way the law is on statutes of limitations, I, I don't think that there will be any indictments coming out of this. And I think we can draw some conclusions from this. One, these type of cases are very, very difficult to put together. I, I'm, look, I'm a lawyer. I know what it takes to get an indictment which is you have to go in front of a grand jury. And while people say, oh, well, you can indict a ham sandwich in, in front of a grand jury, it is true in some respects, but when you get into complicated cases, these investigations take years. Sometimes hundreds of witnesses are called, as were in this case, and it took two years just to issue a report that probably won't even lead to indictments. So I know there's a lot of theories out there that there's all these indictments that are going to be coming against people. I'm not, I, I'm very, I'm not very skeptical. I'm, I, I'm very skeptical that these reports are true. 40,000 indictments is the last number that I saw. And because what happens is when people start to get investigated, they do like in the investigations involving Trump and Manafort and and the people in the Trump campaign, and even people on the Clinton side, what do they do? They lawyer up. 
and there were 40,000 indictments have been issued, there would be, what, a lot of people lawyering up. And everybody in the legal community would be talking about it. There would be tremendous buzz. And while the grand jury operates in secret, the fact that it's operating is not secret. And so I'm just, I'm just suggesting that that number 40,000 is way overstated, and in my view, based on the research I've done, is based on a very flawed search methodology. And look what happened here. It took two years to investigate this with what so far is zero indictments. A lot of these priests are dead. A lot of these priests have moved on to other places. Some, I think, have even moved on to the Vatican. I remember I was in Boston when the cardinal that was in Boston back in 2002 was, I remember I walked by the courthouse that morning on my way to a deposition in Boston. There were, every news agency in the world was there to hear, to follow the news about the cardinal in Boston being deposed in the sex abuse cases there. I mean, every, I had to walk, I had to carry my, my briefcase or my, my suitcase over the cables on the, from all CNN, NBC, all the major acres were there that morning. It was a circus. The, 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 the things that are in this report, you can download it. It's 800 pages long. Don't let your kids look at it. Um, but it's, I, I can't talk about it here. It just wouldn't be appropriate. But what some of these priests did, here's, here's one example that I can't talk about. You know what they did? They would, they would find a boy. They usually preyed on fatherless boys. Usually boys, sometimes girls, but usually fatherless children. Because they figured they were an easy mark. And once they were able to sexually abuse that child, they would give them trinkets like a gold cross to wear. And that then marked that child so that other priests could then abuse the child. I, folks, this is sickness on a scale that is epic. This, this in Pennsylvania, I went to high school in Pennsylvania. And you think there were only a thousand victims? That's one state. One. It, it's, it's almost impossible to form the words to express the disgust that I feel. And the reaction of the Pope was, yeah, boy, that was bad. We're sorry that happened. Do something! If you don't support it, do something. Clean house. Get rid of it. I mean, we have reports of people being arrested in the Vatican on child pornography charges. Do something for crying out loud. The only hope, really, is the return of Jesus to get rid of this mess. And listen, he's not coming back as your buddy. He's not coming back as your friend. He's coming back with eyes blazing with fire, with the words, King of Kings and Lord and Lords on his thigh. And he will take care of this. Until then, we have to occupy. I looked at this story this week of this bridge in Genoa, Italy. You know, some, I travel, drive around quite a bit on bridges. Um, they replaced that big bridge up in Cleveland. It was about 200 feet above the Cuyahoga River. <laughs> the little Cuyahoga River. Um, George Washington could throw, he could throw a shot put across the Cuyahoga River. Maybe only a silver dollar across the Potomac which I doubt, but, and that bridge needed to be replaced, and this one collapsed this week. Uh, here's a shot, this is, I got this from Google Earth as to what it looked like. I actually had friends who were in Genoa, they weren't on the bridge, but they saw the bridge last Thursday. 
And then, of course, the bridge collapsed. The number of dead is in the 40s. Uh, it will affect economically that area for many, many years. And look at the headline in the one um, Italian newspaper, Apocalypse Genova. Apocalypse. And I, I mentioned last week, I, I used this example of the lifeboat in Indonesia, people trying to get on. And it was a very narrow way, and it was the only way off the island. Uh, somebody photoshopped it, and I thought I would share this as to what it <laughs> might be, look like. And you can say Jesus is the bridge, and so the bridge collapsed. And a lot of lives were changed. It's, it's heartbreaking. So let's look at a little bit of other news in the, well, I almost said few minutes, but in the time remaining. <laughs> I don't want to create false expectations. So, yeah, not, no fake news there. Jesus is coming back, though. I do know this for sure. This is a story in the paper this week about Venezuela. Venezuela has more oil than Saudi Arabia. Yes, more proven, I believe, more proven oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. It's oil rich. They adopted socialism. If anybody's thinking of voting for these democratic people who s support socialistic ideas, collect all the Venezuela articles that you can and make a deal with your friend. I'll read your socialism garbage if you read my stuff, okay? By the way, I did that once with a friend on the creation evolution debate. I said, look, I'll read your junk, you read my junk. And you know what happened? He'd never read that junk. <laughs> and he, his, his comment was, you know, they make some very good points. Yeah, they do. Um, but here's, this is, and so the, the big story out, this is from Zero Hedge in the New York Times the other day, Venezuela in chaos after Maduro announces massive 95% devaluation, new exchange rate tied to cryptocurrency. And the reports were, this is one chart that was at Zero Hedge, an inflation rate, annual inflation rate of 108,000%. I've heard that the rate this week hit a million percent. This is numbers that were not even seen in Germany between World War I and World War II in terms of the amount of inflation. This is the lead article in this, this story. Chaos and confusion erupted across Venezuela, and most stores were shuttered on Saturday after President Nicolas Maduro announced that the government would enact a massive currency devaluation, implement a new minimum wage, uh, hike taxes and also raise gasoline prices for most citizens, even as the country struggles with the greatest hyperinflation on record, surpassing even that of the Weimar Republic in Germany. This is huge news. And you, you don't really even hear that much about it. I mean, look, the reports are there, but it's not focused on. And yet people who support the same principles, governing principles, that led to this mess are, are, are winning elections here in the United States. I believe, okay, now I'm, okay, fact check me on this if you will. There was a Rasmussen um, survey of about three or four years ago that at that time said 53% of Democrats support socialism. I believe that's correct. By the way, it's, I think 90% of Republicans. This is uh, just absolute insanity. To follow up on a story I covered last week, Jeremy Corbyn, who could, depending on the way the politics go, could become prime minister of Great Britain. 
He laid a wreath at the graves of Munich terrorists. He was interviewed this week about that. And of course, they like, oh, he, he just, he didn't mean that, didn't really happen. The Zionists are after him. You know, it's the Jew, it's always the Jews' fault or people who support the Jews. So here's what he said. And, and listen, I take, I've taken a number of classes in, because I depose people. I've taken thousands of depositions. And you begin to learn for signs of when people are lying to you. Some, if you know about their character, you just assume it off, right off the bat. But others are very clever, and they're very persuasive. But there are certain clues. Now, when I, some of the seminars that I took on this, they used to use video deposition clips uh, to prove their point about when somebody was lying. They, they used a lot of clips of Bill Clinton, to be honest with you. Okay? So now I want you to watch Jeremy Corbyn and understand that not answering a question, trying to deflect, change the subject, is a sign that someone is lying. So here, just, just operate with that in mind. Here's Jeremy Corbyn. There's a photo of you with a wreath, um, and that wreath appears to have been laid by the graves of the Black September attackers. So did you lay that wreath on those graves or by those graves? The Black September attackers, as you refer to them, uh, some of those that were accused of that were actually killed in Paris, and some of those were killed in Beirut by Israeli agents. There were people there who were not involved in anything to do with that whatsoever. Okay, did he answer the question? Okay. And indeed, it was Yasser Arafat's number two who was actually killed during that raid. And I, along with other colleagues who were delegates to the conference, laid a wreath in memory of all those that have died. Okay, the delegates were, and colleagues were ter other terrorists. In the hope that we have a peace process and peace in the future, so those raids are never repeated. So to be clear, because I really I'm, don't I'm want totally, to... Yeah. I'm totally clear. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. totally clear that the way forward is of peace, the way forward is of dialogue, the way forward is of recognition. It is not bombing. It is not shooting civilians in Gaza. So you did lay a wreath. Um, in memory of all those that died in the 1985 Israeli attack, which, as I've repeated now again, was condemned by the UN Security Council and the UK government and the US government. But was that wreath not laid by the graves of those who were killed in the Mossad strike in Paris in 92? It was laid on the graves of all those that had died. And you did take Look, part in I laying I totally wreath. condemned what happened in Munich in 1972. Appalling, totally wrong by any stretch of the imagination. You, you said a moment ago that your view is that the way to get to peace is to engage with people and to talk to people. Um, and you've said that you've shared platforms with people who you disagree with entirely mm. as a means to doing that. Um, but I wonder on how many occasions you've shared a platform or been at that kind of conference with members of the Israeli government and whether you've ever laid a wreath at the graves of Israelis killed in Palestinian attacks. I've met many people from Israeli parliament, the Knesset, over the years. I've indeed visited the Knesset and I met visiting Israeli delegations when they've been to Britain. And of course, anybody killed in this awful conflict has to be mourned and the killing has to be condemned. The way forward has to be dialogue, which can bring about a long-term peace process. And so I would say respectfully to President and Prime Minister Netanyahu, the killing of all those civilians in Gaza has been condemned all around the world. Keeping the people of Gaza corralled in by military force isn't going to bring about peace any more than expanding settlements is going to bring about peace. Surely the way forward is the recognition of Palestine and with it alongside, of course, the recognition of Israel. Is that shocking enough for you? Pray for Great Britain, the UK, that they not elect this person. It, uh, it's, it's, I, again, it's one of these, I, I get to these points and I, I listen to this. 
I analyze it, and I almost cannot form the words to tell you exactly what I think. Because I, I, I want to pound on things. I want to, by the way, I, they, I saw some place where they have this giant enter button. It's, it's made of like memory foam. And so when you want to send something on Facebook or something, you can pound on it, you know, right on your desk, and it absorbs all the energy. So <laughs> I get, my wife will put that on my Christmas list. So I can pound on that instead of yelling at the TV, as I'm prone to do more and more these days. She will, she will tell you. So let's look at some of the other things that go. Um, the... Um, by the way, if you want to send me one, you can send me one. You might want to send me like five or six of them and wrap like a brand new Titleist or Callaway driver around it in the, in the package. Just kidding. A little. Um, the um, Trump administration, I mentioned this last week, seeks to hold millions to aid, in Palest and aid the Palestinians. And so then there was this, these other reports and this is from foreign policy. For Trump and company, few Palestinians count as refugees. And they cited some statements made by Jay Sekulow about what he said, that these really don't qualify as, as refugees under the UN rules and regulations. And to foreign policy's credit, uh, you know, they will present opposing views many times. And they allowed Jay Sekulow to write an article. And he wrote an article. You can look it up on their website. Uh, UNRWA has changed the definition of refugee, and he says these people are not refugees. And we never talk about um, other people who are refugees. Iran is reeling under sanctions. This is from the head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, very close to the regime, General Sadar Haj Salamini. And this is a picture, this was on his Instagram account this week. And so you, you, I don't read Farsi, although Google Translate does a very good job of giving you the sense of what they're saying. But the picture says a lot of what he's thinking about, right? What's that a picture of? It's the White House blowing up. They, they put pictures up of them marching on the Temple Mount. It's very clear what they want to do. This peace process thing, though, and so Iran is reeling under the sanctions. Uh, they have a lot of problems. There's, you know, the Trump administration is really trying to push economic sanctions as a way to get around things. Uh, Jason Greenblatt, David Friedman, and Nikki Haley, uh, and Jared Kushner uh, put this. This came out through uh, Jason Greenblatt's uh, Twitter account. The Palestinians of Gaza, they're trying to get this peace plan in place. And to be honest with you, I think they're being very clever the way they're going about it. They're trying to cause economic concerns, economic issues. And by the way, Jeremy Corbyn, Gaza, Israel's only on three sides of the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Well, two sides. <laughs> the Mediterranean is one. The north side is Israel. The east side is Israel. But the south part of Gaza is e Egypt. Does Egypt close the border crossings there? You know, all the time. <laughs> Why? Because they have problems all throughout the Sinai with terrorists, and they, a lot of times they come out of Gaza. So don't blame it all on Israel, is what I'm saying. The Palestinians of Gaza, this is what Jason Greenblatt said. And this was published, you can see on the left, it was published in English. Hebrew and Arabic. The Palestinians of Gaza are stuck in a vicious cycle where corrupt and hateful leadership has provoked conflicts leading to reduced opportunities and the poverty and hopelessness that follow. And so they're trying to, they're trying to raise, they're, they're approaching their desire to bring some kind of peace deal to fruition in, in a different way that's not really been tried before. U.S. warns that no one will be fully pleased by the Israeli-Palestinian peace plan. These were the headlines all over the place. Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, Arad Shiva, this week. I haven't even had time to look at this yet, but on Friday, the U.N. chief 
um, Guterres issued a report, 14 pages, I've not been able to find the exact report online yet. It usually takes about a week for the UN to get their um, stuff. I almost said nonsense, but to get their stuff out there. UN chief, but, but you need to understand this about the centrality of Israel in the end times and what the Bible says will happen. And here is UN chief proposes options to protect Palestinians. Israel says no. One of the proposals is this. These are some of the, in the 14-page report. Providing a more robust UN presence on the ground with rights monitors and political officers to report on the situation. Pouring in more UN humanitarian and development aid to ensure the well-being of the population. And that's been done. What, what do they do with it? They build terror tunnels. Creating a civilian observer mission that would be present in sensitive areas such as checkpoints and near Israeli settlements with a mandate to report on protection issues. And finally, this proposal, this proposal, this comes from the, the mouth of secular press and the head of the UN, Guterres, deploying an armed military or police force under a UN mandate to provide physical protection to Palestinian civilians. And so in a one world, you would say, what, what would the world look like if, say, Jeremy Corbyn headed the UN? It would look like this. <laughs> this is what it would look like. And this is, what, this is what the Bible says it will be like. The head of the Mossad, I, I could do a whole hour on what the former Mossad chief said. Because a lot of what he said, and this is an article in the Jerusalem Post this week, you can find it, uh, Tamir Prado, Pardo, how he would solve the Hezbollah, Palestinian, and Iran issues. And he talks about how, we'll, how would we go about this. And one of the things he says is we would do sanctions, economic sanctions. And so there's, there's a very close correlation between what he proposes and what's actually being pushed by the Trump administration to make them suffer economically and they would come. In the New York Times this week, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the newly elected uh, Ottoman head, of, not Ottoman, Turkey slash Ottoman head, president for life, wrote a, they gave him a page in the editorial page. They gave a, they, about the nation state bill that Israel enacted, they gave Ron Lauder of the Louder Cosmetics family a chance to say, oh, this nation state bill is just horrible. Now they did give, it wasn't published in the paper, like Louder's article, but they did give Natalia Bennett a chance to respond. And maybe if we have time next week, we'll talk about this. But Turkey's in crisis. They're, they're Lira, they're, they're, um, they're, there's no sound. Well, there's sound. A day after two major ratings agencies downgraded Turkey closer to junk status amid a currency crisis, Turkish President Erdogan says he'll challenge those playing games on the economy. He was speaking at a congress of his ruling AK party on Saturday. Today, some people are trying to threaten us through the economy, through sanctions, foreign exchange interest rates and inflation. We're telling them we've seen your games and we are challenging you. Standard & Poor's cited extreme lira volatility and forecasted a recession next year. Heavy selling in recent weeks has spread to other emerging market currencies and global stocks which has deepened concerns about the economy. Turkey's battered lira weakened 3% after a Turkish court rejected an American pastor's appeal for a lease. And so this, uh, these sanctions are being enacted because President Trump thinks this man should be released. There was actually, uh, now Erdogan denies it. There was a deal. Israel would release a certain activist and he would be released. The activist was released and Pastor Brunson is still in custody in Turkey. He may be on like house arrest now, but 
Um, this has been going on for almost two years for him. Another couple quick little prophetic things. This, you know, I get up here and I always think, this is only going to be 40 minutes. So, uh, Tom Press, Trump advisor. U.S., Israel, Russia all want Iran out of Syria. I think this is a prophetic issue. We have, we have the countries that are identified in Ezekiel 38 and 39, largely present in Syria on the northern border of Israel. Now, there are different views on when Ezekiel 38 happens, and I don't have time to go into them yet again today. Some think it's before the 70th week of Daniel, at least three and a half years before. Some think it's just before the 70th week of Daniel. Some think it's early in the 70th week of Daniel, and others think it's near the end of the 70th week of Daniel. And I don't have time to go into all those different views today. Some, someday I will. But there, there are a lot of different views on the timing of some of these events. And the people hold different timing views of your, on Ezekiel 38 and other issues of prophecy. They're not heretics. They're not unsaved or anything. These are future events. So uh, I think it would be a good idea sometimes to say, like when we're talking about the timing of the Ezekiel 38 war, is I believe it happens before this 70th week of Daniel starts so far. So far, that's what I believe. Because the proof of... Because it's a future event. It's not a fact yet. We know it's going to happen. But the, and there are a lot of views, and people make a lot of good arguments as to why their view is better than other views. But I think sometimes we get a little bit um, wedded to our views. And look, I have opinions too. You know, it just happens. Mine are usually... Um, well, I, don't, I probably shouldn't go there. But this is, this is, I think this is significant. This is John Bolton this morning in Israel saying this. Here's another thing. There was a Caspian Sea agreement. The Caspian Sea has five countries around it. Iran on the south, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Russia. Is that five? Well, whatever the five are. You can look it up. It's a very oil-rich area. There are talks of building pipelines across it to go into Europe. Russia, of course, wants to be part of that because they need, that's where they get most of their revenue. And this is what Zero Hedge said about this deal that came about this week. This was the art of the deal, Central Asian style. What's already established is that the Caspian 2.0 is a major multilateral win for Eurasia integration. Now, I personally think, and I have said this for 20 years, that if Russia is one of the parties that comes into Ezekiel 38, there are other people that they bring with them. It's not just Iran, it's many peoples with them. And I've often talked about the Stam Republics in Central Asia. Those of you who've listened to me all those years know this. And those are Muslim republics. And what would get Russia to go in there if they had a Muslim problem that might draw them into that, apart from the economic thing? And by the way, it says in Ezekiel 38 that I will what? Put a hook in your jaw. No, that's not what it says. I will put hooks in your jaw. It's not going to be just one thing that draws them in. Could be economic, but listen, if Russia, and then Russia does have an Islamic problem, what would get that part of the world off their back for a while, if other than invading Russia? And the other thing that I want you to look at, and this is sometimes overlooked in Ezekiel 38 and 39, is this. It says in there, <clears throat> that I will draw you back, I will turn you back and, and bring you into the land. Now, I was looking at some commentaries on that, and one person said, well, this just doesn't make any sense. If, if Russia is here, and how are they turned back and brought in? It doesn't make any sense to me. But let me suggest to you that 
maybe we're overlooking something. Maybe Russia is already there. And Russia is trying to leave and starting to leave. And then they are drugged back in. And I'm just suggesting to you, not dogmatic about it, but is that a possibility in the way things are structured right now in that part of the Middle East? Does Russia want to get out? Right. They may be leaving. It's, I think it's a part of Ezekiel 38 and 39 that we overlook. So that's the tip of the prophetic update iceberg this week. There's a lot going on. Pay attention. Share the gospel. Prepare your hearts and minds to meet the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Father, pray that you bless us this week. Help us to always live, act, breathe, and trust in the hope of our of your return and our being with you bless us this week in Jesus name amen